Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Photography Live in a Cut. My name is Paul Griffiths. Well, you know that bit. Uh, <laughs> good evening. Um, there comes a time when you're looking around on YouTube, which I found uh, one particular day when I was doing some work and I came across a video of, uh, of a lecture. And uh, I just had it on the background while I was doing some work and wasn't thinking much more about it, apart from just listening to what this this fellow had to say. And I must be honest, uh, I had to stop what I was work doing because uh, I found his work and what he was actually saying about photography just hit a chord and a, a really fantastic. I offered him the chance to come and join me on the show and I was delighted that Sean Perry, who's in Austin, Texas, could join me this evening. Sean, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thank you. Delighted to be here. That's great, Sean. I, I must say that that when I saw that lecture with uh, where you're talking to the students about fine art photography, it, it started off and I thought, well, I just have this on in the background, as I said to you last night, but I just in the end I had to put the pen down and, and just listen. It was fantastic because fine art photography to me is such a, a dare I use the pun, a fine line. How would mm. you actually describe fine art photography for yourself? Well, it's such a it's such a tricky word. I mean, I, I I've always tried to make things with quality and um, authentic and um, there, there's a quote by Paul Rand who's a graphic designer that's always meant a lot to me he says you know don't try to be original just try to be good so I've always tried to embody that sort of thought and you know fine art has been a path for me to show and share work um, but not an identifier you know I, I had never there was never a point where I said I think I'd like to try to make fine art pictures it was more along the lines of just loving things that I had seen and wanting to make the best things that I could and that's the area and the place where my career kind of took root if, if that makes sense yeah it does actually it does has photography always been your passion or is it something which you grew into well, I've always loved pictures, um, movies uh, specifically, um, but no, photography wasn't uh, like a first career to me. I, I came to it a bit later. Um, I was trained as a musician and uh, played music for you know, 20, 25 years, um, and photography was sort of an outlet away from music. And you know, it's, it's kind of a common story with musicians and chefs and photographers. They all tend to swim yeah, in real yeah. similar waters, you know. Yeah, um, that's right. So there was a point where um, that road just kind of forked and uh, photography, photography took over. You know? it, it is quite amazing how many guests I've had who have either gone through a, a, a musical background have gone to university or college as you call it studied music or studied produ producing music mm. that have ended up being in some form a photographer down the line and, and music has then become their second interest where photography is literally just taken over mm. yeah i mean they're, they're so tightly intertwined on lots of different ways and and for me um you know they, they share similar language and similar feelings it's just the, the end result is just slightly different. You know, the, for music, it's in embodying the sound and for photographs, in embodying the print, you know. Yeah. But, but past those two things, uh, I find just so, so much similarity between the two. It, it's amazing because, as I said, spoken to so many, Rick Salmon, Ted Vieira, uh, Ted Forbes, in actual fact, mm -hmm. the art of photography is a great musician from, from what I realize a musician, and uh, the, the, the many others, many others. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go right back to when you were a kid, Sean. Okay. Can you recollect a camera went in the household before, uh, you, you know, that, that sure. your mother and father had? Yeah, sure. Uh, Polaroids. Uh, we had a lot of Polaroid cameras, yeah. and you know, probably the the proper camera would have been uh, Kodak Instamatic, um, yeah. with the flash cubes, you know, on top. Yeah. And uh, but Polaroids were the ones that really uh, lit me up because you know later with photography, like so many photographers, it was the dark room that uh, yeah. really made all this happen for me, um, and where I really. Uh, fell in love with it um so from being a little kid the polaroids were like that it just magic i mean still to me magic i love polaroids so yeah they are they're amazing when they actually put out i never actually owned a polaroid i must be honest but i always remember mm. when i first saw one being used i thought wow this is this is this is technology <laughs> yeah. when you think about what we've got now so you went through uh, from we'll say from school through college basically you're following through uh, music what did you study in college i studied music um oh, i right, love okay. 
Yep, I uh, left. I had the opportunity to leave high school a little early and start at a music college and um, started playing in bands when I was 13, 14 years old. And um, so I went off to, to music school when I was 16 and studied, uh, studied music. So it so really was music was well entrenched in your interest and still photography is nowhere to be seen at this time or just the odd bit of photography now and then? Well, I never, I never really actively like tried to be a photographer in those days. I loved pictures and mm. you know the kind of imagery around uh, music and um, albums and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so there was a lot of imagery around me, but I wasn't really working as a photographer. And when I when I left college and was uh, playing in a band that had started to travel. Um, I got really lucky in the sense I was playing with a couple of brothers who I had seen as a young teenager and really admired and um, a position had opened up in their band and I got a chance to audition and get in this band. But the lead singer and songwriter, piano player for that band was a photographer, a really great photographer, kind of my first influence. And he worked for a uh, music magazine where he would uh, shoot local bands and write articles and concerts and things like that. So I had the opportunity to help him in the darkroom with some of that stuff. Right. And uh, so started around then, you know, 19, 20 years old. And, but still music was the thing. I mean, I was writing songs and traveling and trying to make records and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't much, much later, you know, 10, over 10 years later before I picked up a camera and then started making my own pictures. And, and what was the first camera that you bought? Well, um, it was actually given to me from another bandmate and it was a Minolta X700 and uh, still have it, uh, still Amazing. love it. Yeah, still yeah. have it, you know, still use it. Um, there's and a again, again, so many people uh, uh, that I've spoken to, their first SLR camera was a Minolta. It is quite mm -hmm. amazing that, you know, uh, and I've, I've said this before many times on my show, I remember going into my local camera shop and I, and I honestly can't remember seeing a box for a Nikon or a Canon. Uh, it was mm. either pa Pentax or Practica or... Mm. But I ended up buying a brick. I ended up buying the Zenit E, which got me started mm. in my photography. But there you go. That's uh, that's another story. So, with the Minolta, you know, uh, from there, obviously, uh, you started to get into uh, photography. What sort of area of photography did you enjoy uh, taking images? Was it concerts and the like, or what, did you have another interest? I was photographing uh, everything. I mean, right. most, mostly I started shooting uh, my friends. I was working in, uh, like most musicians, working in restaurants and bars and um, just amazing uh, characters that you end up working in, in those environments. So I was photographing uh, aspiring actors and comedians and chefs and uh, people mostly, actually. Um, you know, black and white color. I mean, one of the things that had happened is I, I was aware of photographers and aware of photography. So I was looking at a lot of uh, pictures and there's a there's a photographer duo, uh, twin brothers named the Starn brothers, uh, Doug and Mike Starn. And I had seen that work um, when I was younger and it had a huge impact on me. So, you know, there was always this disconnect of I was making things that look like pictures, but the things I loved look like objects, you know, so I was always yeah. trying to to shorten that distance, like how do you get to where the thing becomes an object, not just a picture, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that was it, you know, a lot of black and white stuff and then looking at a lot of uh, photographers. I mean, I think it finally started to um, make that transition for me. Two things is uh, really the chemistry in the darkroom and uh, starting to bleach and distress and do things like that with photographs. And then the other was starting to shoot squares um, when yeah. I moved over to a Hasselblad. I had the chance to work with a Hasselblad camera and um, it just, it was a nice shift. It became much more uh, simpler working within a square and uh, that kind of went along with uh, the time I was putting in the darkroom. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that actually, but first let's go back to the de decision or the mm -hmm. way your work has developed. A lot, when we have a look at your screen share, uh, soon, uh, the majority of your work, if not all of your work, is now basically mono. Is that correct? It is. I, I shoot color for magazines occasionally. Okay. Um, and, I, and I love making color photographs. And I actually, I have a little book that I've been working on with um, one of my favorite curators in the world, Elizabeth Avedon, uh, that's all color. So um, 
but most of what people think of me and my pictures that they've seen yeah. is black and white. Yep. The development on of your photography from taking photographs of people in the bars, how would you sort of describe your next step as regards to what you wanted to do? You talked about the, the fact that you'd like to distress your photographs in, in the dark room and looking to bleach them and, and looking at experimenting that side. But the actual taking part, the taking of the image, what, what were you, could you just describe potentially what was going through your mind at that time as regards to what, what you were looking to achieve? Sure. I mean, for, for for photographing the people and the musicians, it was, you know, just trying to, like any portrait photographer, like trying to get a sense of them that was yeah. different in a conversation, you know, that, like that that moment. And um, there's a photographer that I really love, Dan Winters, and yeah. he, he has a quote um, about the moment between the moments often being the most interesting photographs found, you mm -hmm. know. And I, I think subconsciously that that was it. There's like looking, you know, we, all kinds of things. We're having conversations when we're making pictures and then, you know, say something outrageous to get somebody to laugh or just trying to find those moments in between, I think is how I would uh, describe it best. And um, the bleach and the, you know, the distressing and all that kind of stuff was, um, I, I guess to get my hands on it, you know, to, to, to try to find my voice through it or, to, you know, what it was that I was trying to express that um, I, I think the craft part of it. And, the, you know, there's a, there's always influences, you know, like uh, Tim Rudd. Uh, toning and stuff. so th that was a big influence on me too. When I, uh, found some of the recipes and things that were going on with that stuff um, and i really fell in love with that process could you just go back because uh, you cut out as you were mentioning you said tim we didn't get the surname of uh, the mm, rudman uh r-u-d-m-a-n um, yeah tim rudman it's a name i'm familiar with but uh, can't recollect any of his work when would you actually say was your defining moment that you said right for let's forget music sean i'm gonna be a photographer I, I don't know if I've even had that moment yet you know it, okay. it, it's <laughs> it's been a <laughs> it, it's uh, you know it's just been a thing where um, it's kind of an ongoing an ongoing process of um, you know trying to make good work and consistently and be involved with people that you know you want to be with and you want to work with um, my career started to take off in the sense that I I had a chance to do an, an exhibition and uh, some things came from that and uh, a body of work that I had made at the time, I got a chance to do a book around. So more things happened and then, you know, I showed some work and then some other things happened and I found myself in New York and, you know, it's just these progressions of, of this ongoing process that, yeah. um, you know, music became a smaller part. And I, I, initially what's ironic about all this for me was, I wanted to be in the darkroom and I wanted to make photographs because I didn't need anyone else. I didn't need a band, essentially. You know, yeah. you didn't have to worry where the drummer was or what, you know, chasing down this out or the other. You could just, I could just go off and do stuff. And what's come full circle around is what I enjoy about photography now um, is almost the sense of a band, of the, op the opportunity to work with um, curators and the opportunity to work, you know, to make books and, uh, the written word around pictures and you know it's come full circle to where it is um, a photographic band in a sense i enjoy yeah. that interaction of working with really great creative people so when you first came upon the idea or was it suggested to you to do the uh, to do an exhibition did you just say right i'm going to put an exhibition of some work on in some place or, or were you asked mm -hmm. It, you know, it, kind of like a uh, long story short, uh, where my dark room was, was a gallery a couple of doors down. And, you know, in between uh, print washing or whatever, would visit with the curator, uh, director of that gallery. And they, they did a summer juried show every year. And uh, she suggested that I put a piece in for that. And I did. Um, and it ended up doing really well. Um, actually won um, an award from that show and sold on opening night. And all of this was, you know, very unexpected and exciting. 
But fast forward a year later, I mean, that's what's so odd about these things is I was at an opening for a friend and got to meet the gallery owner and started talking and it came up that I made pictures and asked where, you know, just normal conversation and that gallery where my print had been came up and he started talking about a print that he had tried to buy that sold out immediately that he remembered from that gallery and it was my print. So wow. he offered me a show or, you know, from that um, to see more work and then uh, to an exhibition and it's strange, you know, how these things happen, you know, but uh, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that amazing? And how many, so from, say, so you got your exhibition, how many actual prints of, of, of copies rather of that single, single print would you in actual fact make for that show? Oh, um, you know, I, I do smaller editions, usually uh, eight or uh, 17 in, in an edition. But for an exhibition like that, it would have been, you know, 20, 25 pieces. Right. Okay. Um, you know, the, this kind of went along like parallel where um, a sculptor who's been a big influence to me um, turned me on to public art and um, call for entry opportunities and shows. And um, so I started sending workouts for different group exhibitions and publishing opportunities. And, you know, it was, it was a great way to um, try to have an audience for the work so it wasn't just stacking up under my bed you know as a place for these yeah. things to yeah. a place for these things to go and this was you know kind of before it really sort of took off on the internet there wasn't uh, the sharing mm -hmm. sites and all of those type things I, I there was a couple of magazines i would get every month like art calendar and sculpture magazine and then go through the classifieds and look for opportunities um, so over the course of a couple of years, I was able to do lots of exhibitions um, all over the country, um, one or two pieces at a time. And when I started going to portfolio reviews, it was a chance to kind of continue that dialogue with some of the curators and jurors that I had met from that process. Yeah. So let me just take you back a little bit there. Where you say you're actually sending your work out for people mm -hmm. to consider. You're actually sending out a, a, an actual mounted print off to the... <laughs> To the gallery or or what yeah but back then i mean every opportunity had a different language um for the most part it was slides so i would actually oh, okay. make, i would make copy slides of my black and white prints um occasionally someone would want to print um, but you didn't really have to do that unless you were accepted to the exhibition or to the opportunity you know ironically this was one of the best things that could have happened for me with digital because I started scanning film and scanning my negatives um, or scanning my negatives and scanning prints and trying to make what happened in the computer match what happened in the dark room. So, so the process of doing all that stuff helped me uh, understand digital and kind of uh, focus my skills that, that yeah. way, which has been a you know, huge asset. Yeah. So it's it's amazing how you've developed your career by by sort of uh, taking that that route uh, and and that uh, remarkable story where you said this guy mm. missed out on a print and was was involved at the next exhibition went out. Let's do a screen share, uh, Sean, because um, just out of interest in passing it, those images you're talking about from that are they in in any part of the uh, one of these galleries on the website? No, I mean, I think the, close, yeah, the closest in that period would be the work transitory. Um, okay. That's when I, that was the sort of first big uh, series of work that I did um, where I'm shooting square. Um, and, you know, a cobbler's son has no shoes. You know, I'll, I'll kind of fall back on that old adage. Like my, I eventually will build a new website. And yeah. um, some of that work hopefully will end up on it. Well, I've got to be honest with you. When I first uh, obviously heard your lecture, um, I, I thought, well, I've got to check this guy's workout. And I went onto the website, and I, I really like the style of it. I must be honest mm. with you. Uh, oh, I, from, a, from a personal angle, the only thing I'm disappointed about is that the images on your website don't go any bigger than than uh, than what you, you actually showed mm. it. But that's, mm. that's, that's just a thing in passing. But um, I think when you when you actually see uh, it, it's it's just a, a lovely style of of, of uh, the way you actual fact uh, display your work. I'm just mm. going through very quickly here the website because there are other sites that we can actual fact visit, uh, especially your Instagram site and uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the one with the um, lens culture. Couldn't think of mm. what it was, but we certainly just have a quick look at the the way the website builds when you mm. actually go into uh, into your site and. Uh, you know, we have Monolith, we have Gotham, 
uh, fairgrounds is I want to talk to you a lot about fairgrounds because that's when you started talking about your fairground images in that lecture that's when the pen dropped and yeah, I thought, I've got to look at this um, and, and I gotta say you know that that series that you're referring to is uh, from the School of Visual Arts and it's called their i3 series by uh, Katrine Eisman and yeah, you know, she's she's just such a wonderful force and advocate for uh, photography, uh, and big influence to me. So you know that that lecture was really exciting and uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to do. Yeah, it was uh, it really as I say, my my pen dropped at that point, and then started. Let's go and uh, go on to the Instagram site <clears throat> where we can see some images a little bit bigger mm. uh, for for the viewers uh, of the site. Um, and we go back and there is as we see here a sort of a a, a continuity of your work here but sort of there's the fairgrounds again of the mm. <coughs> of the air show excuse me um of the of that and uh he's sharing some some images out there uh i'm just seeing if we can uh, uh there must be some more images here uh from yeah. this, down here load more so if i just do the we'll click on from here um yeah, the neon light there against the against the uh, the windows uh, of the office blocks. Yeah, that was a special um, I think thing they had up for uh, Christmas in New York for uh, Dior. Yeah. Kind of... Let's go back to the. Uh, let's click on a couple here, and uh, what I do is I come down. There is in some of them, if you don't mind me saying, an an, an element of Michael Kenner. Mm. It, would I be right in assuming that Michael is one of your Yes. Favorite photographers? Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. I mean, I, um, you know, I, I gosh, he, when, uh, when I discovered there's a, you know, there's so many influences, but, um, the thing about, uh, Michael was, um, how he was able to put, uh, you know, the projects together and, uh, the final presentation of the book and the print, and then the way that he just embodied, um, the entire thing, you know, yeah. and I've always, for me, like, you know, learning was um, really, you know, kind of um, researching my heroes and how they thought and lived and uh, made their, not just the technical side of it. I wasn't really ever interested in what camera um, Michael Kenna was using, but I was, you know, so fascinated with how he felt about printing or, you know, why, uh, why things looked the way they did or how, you know, what his life was like. Um, so that was just a big thing, and the, you know, I I was able to get a copy of his uh, Japan book, um, yeah. and another one, uh, Nightwork, um, and it just you know, it was just beautiful. Um, and then you know, learning about how he always made one particular size, and he was just so thoughtful about every part of the process. Uh, it really moved me. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned yesterday when we had a pre pre show chat. Uh, having talked to Michael myself on a, a, a couple of occasions now, it, to me, his, uh, his work is, uh, it comes from his printing abilities. He knows what he wants to be printing before mm. he takes that shot. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also the other thing about it being the fact that they are always square, I can't think of any image that which I've seen, which has been a different format. Um, again, I think it just shows his his ability, his classic ability to to effectively get the essence of of the image and and create an atmosphere in an image uh, that that he does. And sometimes these very heavy grained images that he's done, and as you know, he uses the Hasselblad, or even sometimes mm -hmm. uses the Holger. Uh, right. He's, that's his, uh, his street cameras. Uh, he jokingly mentioned to me when we were chatting, but. Um, yeah, they see it, it, it. This this is a this this typical shot here. Hmm. I could I can imagine if 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 someone was to present this as a camera club uh, competition, hmm. I think the the judge would probably sort of step back and think, what am I supposed to be looking at? But there's just so much atmosphere going on with this image. You know, you mm -hmm. you, you know exactly what uh, we're, we're doing here. It's a fairground. It's uh, it's it, it. As I say, it was it was imagery which just uh, just caught my my attention at that time where where you've uh, the work you've created here thank you let's move on to uh, uh we'll do that one in a minute because i want to talk to you about that that particular book and the other one is um we won't do fairgrounds now we'll because uh, we've shown that quite a bit now 
This is uh, from the website uh, Lens Culture, where Sean has a has a particular uh, section of his work. Um, let's talk cameras now, Sean. Um, sure. you, you mentioned to me that you moved on to the Hasselblad. Um, yep. Why? Uh, you know, I, at the time, I I was uh, I was shooting 35 millimeter and um, and printing a lot, and I, I had the opportunity to uh, take a photography course um, where I was um, learning how to shoot with medium format and four by five and uh, study with a commercial photographer. And there were a couple of different uh, systems we were working with, um, but it was just the Hasselblad that when I picked it up. Um, the sound that it made and the way that it hit, hit my hands, um, you know, from a romantic standpoint, it's the camera on the, from, you know, that went to the moon. Um, yeah. It just made sense. You know, it was the f first time I picked something up and it was like, this is, this is just perfect. And I think one of Kenna's influences for me was, um, you know, I, one of the ways I tried to get better was to limit how many ways I could screw up. So if I made a decision that I wasn't going to crop anything, that I was always going to shoot full frame, well, then that was, you know, one more variable that I could delete. So always use the same film. It's always the same lens. It, I always run the film the same way. I, if, the, if, if I don't get what I want in the frame, it means I need to move my feet, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it was that influence and that camera that I was able to um, – be able to, to, to make work um, like this. And, you know, this project, um, like every everything that I've ever um, been able to do that I, you know, like, um, I guess it's a funny way to say it, but is always when, um, you know, I'm trying, I'm, I'm able to get out of the way and uh, try to make something about what I'm feeling or what it, what it sounds like essentially, you know? So for those, those pictures that we've been looking at, like I, it wasn't a thing of me knowing that I wanted to make those pictures. It was a, it was more a process of, I was seeing light in Texas at that time, right at the end of the day and all of the built environment of these electrical towers and cement structures that for this just brief little period of time would just bloom and, yeah. uh, kind of evoke uh, posture. And I wanted to make pictures about that. Um, didn't have an, no clue how I could or be able to do. And I, and I made you know so many bad pictures of it before one image would, that happened that you know, kind of pushed me forward of like, this is better than me. You know, this is something for me to kind of catch up to now. And so I'm always trying to do that in the way that I make work is to put myself um, in that position where something can happen you know you mentioned there uh, one camera one lens yeah what what lens is that that you have fitted to the uh, Hasselblad it's a 120 um, just a fixed lens 120 okay. millimeter on um, an older Hasselblad um, no batteries you know nothing no. uh, nothing fancy um, I do use a red filter um, that's pretty much been welded on the front of that lens okay. for you know, the last 15 years, um, and that's it. I mean, there's... What does uh, 120 uh, calculate to in 35 millimeter terms? Is it is it about 60 mil or? It's a little bit above that. It's, um, right, okay. you know, it, it's not quite 85. It's, it's you know, probably in the low low 70s, I guess. Um, so you this know, the... is where you're probably getting a little bit more of a compression of the image, which you basically, when you're taking, you know, you see that quite a lot in uh, in 35 millimeter film or a one and a half crop or full, full frame, whatever you wish to use, right. using about the 90 to 135 type lens where you start getting that compression and and then things just seem to sort of come together, don't they, when, when you're using that? They do. They do. When I when I shoot 35, I always preferred um, a little bit of compression. And there was a great um, lens that they made. I mean, very very flary and uh, not particularly sharp. But um, I love the look of this lens on that Minolta. And it was a 58 millimeter. So yep. instead of a 50, and just that extra eight millimeter, I just like. I just enjoyed that quality that that mm -hmm. slight compression had. And when when I was trying to, you know, Hasselblad at that, when I first got that system, um, you know, it was financially difficult, of course. And you, you don't just go out and buy four or five Hasselblad lenses, you know, you kind of no, have no, to, no. <laughs> you have to kind of settle on what you want. And a few, a few exhibitions before you can get one of those. 
Right. And, you know, the 100 millimeter is um, one that I was always interested in, but the 120 um, also kind of worked as a macro lens. And I, at, you know, I could put a, an extension ring on it and then use the 120 like a macro lens too. So yeah. at the time I made the decision to go 120. So, you know, 100 millimeter is probably closer to what I was used to with 35, but um, 100 and 120 is about where I like to be. 150 is too much. It, it, it was, uh, yeah. didn't work for me. It's interesting you mentioned that because as until recently, I'm a huge Soul Lighter fan, as uh, as my mm. uh, viewers will know. <clears throat> and I, did, well, I didn't realize how much he used a 90 millimeter lens on on his uh, 35 millimeter cameras, and wow. that then suddenly just the again the the the, the penny dropped, and mm. how Soul Lighter has been able to get such a compression in in his street photography. Yeah, the one that immediately comes to mind is the arm in the taxi cab and. And yep. then you've got all the layers behind uh, uh, with uh, the yellows and the greens, which comes to mind. And, and I suddenly realized, and, and there was another uh, photographer whose name escapes me at the moment. It will come because uh, I've got his book. And uh, again, he uses potentially, uh, it, it is not a lens that you would consider a street photographer to use. I think it's along the lines of an 80 210 or a 75 mm. 210, that sort of uh uh, lens and again that's what obviously the photographer was looking for that that compression it's yeah. uh, I think a lot of street photographers these days are generally looking to use a, a 28 or a 35 mil type lens to sort of get that wide mm -hmm. angle look and say to themselves I want to get in close but it's something which I want to experiment with a, a longer lens and, and look for that compression I think it uh, it could be a, a good uh, a good experiment to do Mm -hmm. I've stopped on this uh, website, uh, Sean, because you very kindly mentioned it to me before the show started, uh, the Special Print and Photo Commission. Mm. Um, tell us about this uh, thing, because this sounds really great, what, uh, what you're involved with. Uh, and whilst you're describing the project, I'll, I'll just scroll down the page and you can see uh, this, this, is, this, this to me looks a real lovely keeper. This is mm. just lovely. Thank you. I mean, for, for me, this is, um, you know, kind of like the perfect example of uh, the things that I love to make. And Friends Without a Border is a uh, foundation that was started by a photographer named uh, Kenro Izu. And he, um, you know, kind of like long story short, was making photographs in uh, Cambodia and was very moved um, about the need for um, to help the children there with uh, health care and um, ended up uh, building a children's hospital um, in uh, in Cambodia and every year the the foundation ran events and there was an auction that they did in New York and you know over over a period of time uh, I believe a million children have been through that hospital now and the foundation is on to their uh, next project um, so I, I've, I've had the chance to contribute prints to this auction for many years. And a couple of years ago, they asked if I would do a commission of, um, of an edition of a photograph and that it would be uh, part of the auction that year. So this was a collaboration between uh, Kenro and myself and then Cloverleaf Studio um, made the enclosure. So the, the front character, the kanji character on the front is uh, drawn by uh, Kenro. And then the it's sort of like a one-page book that's covered in uh, Japanese cloth. And then my print is um, on the inside. And over on the left-hand side is a letterpress uh, printed and editioned and then signed by myself and uh, Kenro. What actually does that say on the left hand side is it is it a description of the of the image or is it just uh, some personal words no it, it describes um the event and a little bit about the image and all of the different uh pieces yeah. that uh, came together um my wife actually made it and the silk the white silk on the inside um it's actually heirloom uh, as a present from her mother so we you know had some uh, family cloth that went into each one and letterpress printed and it's just a real uh, you know kind of beautiful production one of you know i, I like it when photographs can um you know they can go out in the world and and do things and be things. Yeah, exactly. So. It, it, it's it's a, just a beautiful bit of work, absolutely beautiful. From the the uh, the creation of the idea of the book itself, and then the making of the book, 
handmade? This is not through uh, some kind of uh, manufacturer, I take it? No, no, no. It's all, it's they all were... All uh, handmade. Yeah, they were, I believe... beautiful. Thanks. And there's the, sign, there's the image uh, which... Uh, which was in this particular one, uh, this particular book. Mm. I've seen I've seen folios before. Um, Brooks Jensen, I remember, started off doing folios where he put mm -hmm. ten prints together with a small description, yep. and created these envelopes. And Martin Bailey as well from uh, 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 English uh, British photographer based in Tokyo, all those repatriated uh, Japanese now, uh, mm. does the same thing. And mm. I think it's a really great way to put your work together. Either as a single image like you've done here, it's a real lovely keepsake. The design of it, let me just go back to the design of the of the book itself, the front cover there reminds me so much of of the Michael Kenner books that I've got, where he's got this beautiful Japanese silk covering mm. to his uh, to his books. Um, mm. But to have that, as you say, just goes that extra yard in, in presenting um, a quality piece of work and uh, all for a good cause, which is uh, which is just lovely. Yeah, Just I was look, so look, look I was so that. thrilled. That's amazing there. Yeah, I was really thrilled. I mean, it's one of my favorite things I've ever had the chance yeah. to work on. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I've just found the uh, the name of the photographer that I think uses more than likely the Zoom link, Jay Maisel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you would know Jay. Uh, obviously, mm. I, was, I was once accused of... Um, Calling, calling him a, a, a street photographer cheat because he didn't use a, <laughs> a 50 mil lens. So yeah. I'll, I'll take that one back. But that, anyway, no, that's great. And a great, great selection of work there. How did you come about the idea of the, the imagery that you created for Fairground? Because mm. a lot of people will say, okay, let, let's, they're not sharp. But right, in my right. view, I've seen them before. I've seen street photography before. There's to me, there's so much more atmosphere in an image which is not sharp. There is some unfocused part of that image. But how did the idea come about? Um, you know, one part is um, I grew up near an amusement park, so I always have loved roller coasters and rides and carnivals and fairs and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, I have a natural affinity for those places. They just make me so happy. And in Texas, we have these, you know, big parking lot fairs where uh, they'll come in and in a parking lot set up an entire, you know, ride and carnival, and they'll be there for five days and go. And then also the the Austin Rodeo um, is a huge yeah. event, event here. So um, one of I was lecturing at the time, and one of the teachers that I worked with uh, showed horses and was talking about the rodeo. So um, I went and uh, just fell in love with uh, that particular event and started making pictures there. And it was very much like the transitory pictures where, you know, anytime I try to make what's in my head, it, it's awful, you know, just the worst mm -hmm. ever. I'm boring. Um, but it, it's when you get yourself in that situation where something can happen. And there's an image from the fairgrounds series um, and around where uh, it's a swing set and the people are coming around that that picture happened and I just didn't know how I had made it. You know, it was like when seeing it on the contact sheet, it, um, it just, it lit me up because it was so, it was different than what I had expected. Um, and that's what started it is, um, you know, Technically, what it was was backlight and um, figuring out a way to uh, backlight subjects and um, break the scale of things, you know. So um, it was that, that that started that project. So I was shooting, you know, parking lot fairs and the rodeo and just whenever I would find these things, uh, you know, for years. And the scale part of it was a big thing. When I started to um, unfocus the camera a little bit, instead of trying to shoot it sharp and then um, fuzz it in the darkroom. So like one yeah. of the things that, you know, I'll do in the darkroom is bleed out the blacks by printing through plastic or things like that. But it, it wasn't really what I wanted for that until I, you know, unfocused the camera and then all of a sudden the scale completely changed and they, they started to look like tin toys. I mean, you could have almost, like some of them almost appear like they could be on a table, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, that's that's a good example of how I work. It's you know finding those first few pictures that start to relate to one another, that challenge you to figure out more about them, mm -hmm. and then once you know maybe if you're lucky that starts to grow to five, eight, or ten, 
And then I start to, you know, construct a world around those five, eight, or ten, and you start to, you know, get a sense of what's missing, and then you, you know that helps you know what you're what you're looking for. Yeah, I think, that, I've, just that, found the, I think what, I think I've just found the image which uh, you're d talking about, which is, uh, I think, is this one you were talking about? Yep, is that's that the one. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the and one. It, and it's so funny too because, um, you know, I don't. I don't really mind sharing with people that when I first saw it on the contact sheet, I was so disappointed because mm -hmm. the, t the tower in the back with the little flag on top, I didn't want in the frame. I, I, didn't All right, okay. <laughs> I didn't remember seeing that in the frame. I was really just trying to get more of the posture of the machine, of the, of mm -hmm. the ride. But, you know, after about a week and, you know, showing it to one of my, my band brother, the one that was, uh, is a photographer, you know, realizing that I you know, must have hit my head because the tower in the back is, you know, kind of what makes it fun and cool. So, yeah. um, <laughs> isn't it funny how things sort of develop from one one image, and it, it sort of just goes, it sort of sets the 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 touch paper off for you. You think I've I've, I've got a project, I've got a I've got mm -hmm. a portfolio which I know I can build around this, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's uh, that particular image. How did the lecturing start, uh, Sean, with uh, with photography? When I was working as a musician, um, I had started to, I was making pictures and playing music and working in restaurants all at the same time. And I had the good fortune of, um, I had a dark room at that time. So I was printing a lot at night and then working. And um, I had the chance to uh, assist for some photographers um, around, locally and some of them nationally as a com uh, commercial photographers. And I, I was easy to um, not to be threatening because I was just the musician who was making some extra money so they were they were more kind of forthcoming about things you know as opposed to I have a, an aggressive assistant that wants to learn everything about my you know about my business so um, the assisting you know at that time digital was just starting to take off no one was really photographing digitally but they were starting to use Photoshop I mean this was you know late 90s, early 2000, you know, that era. And I quickly realized that if I could scan film and uh, retouch and um, be able to print and uh, FTP photographs to clients and JPEGs and all of those yeah. kinds of things, that um, I could work a lot more and uh, get paid a lot more than lugging around lights and, and that part of it. So I had this chance to kind of work as a digital uh, early version of a digital tech and from there um, I you know, it's kind of like weird how things happen um, I, I knew I knew stuff but I didn't know what I didn't know and I was always very curious about like with Photoshop and these things I was self-taught so I, I kind of wondered what I didn't know and in the back of a uh, business journal I was reading at dinner uh, in a restaurant somewhere there was a ad for um, Adobe uh, certification to be a certified expert in Adobe software. So I thought I would go take the test and just kind of see what I didn't know, essentially. Um, I passed the test and uh, from there found there was a place that was looking for people to train uh, people with Photoshop. So I started working as an Adobe Photoshop trainer, uh, teaching seminars to special forces and uh, IBM and you know corporate clients that would come for three or four days at a time and that teaching element was very interesting to me because so many of the photographers that I admire and have studied teaching has been such an important part of their practice and like I mentioned earlier about the thing that um, you know Michael Keno was such an influence on me was um, about the way he lived his life in order to be able to make the pictures that he did. So, yeah. you know, Ray Metzger and Michael Kennan, you know, so many photographers, like teaching has been such a crucial element. And I, I, want, I wanted to have a part of that um, as my practice. And so many words trying to make it uh, short and clear. But um, at that same time, one of the photographers that I had assisted for and worked with and studied with, um, taught at a college here in Austin, Texas, and their digital person was moving. And they needed to find someone very, very quickly um, to come teach these college courses. So he was very generous um, to uh, put my name in the mix for that. And I was able to 
to get that position. And, you know, at the time, I remember, my, I remember speaking to my father and saying, you know, I have this chance to go teach college. And, you know, it's just so weird. My dad was a teacher, you know, so I, right, okay. I yeah, never thought, uh, so many teachers in my family, it, w- it was never, I didn't picture myself being a teacher. And I remember, you know, him very clearly telling me something. He's like, you can make it one semester, even if it's the worst job you've ever had in your life, you can get through one semester and it'll be such a meaningful experience for you to have, you know, then when, when would you ever have this opportunity to go teach college? So, um, so I did and uh, really just fell in love with being in the classroom and that was 16 years ago. So I've been, uh, I've been teaching for 16 years. And let's bring, bring it right up to date. You told me just before the show started, you've just, uh, yeah, just accepted uh, accepted a job in a local town. I have. Um, I've been uh, teaching as an adjunct um, since that time, and uh, teaching in New York at the School of Visual Arts, and then teaching in Austin at Austin Community College. And uh, just this summer, I accepted a position as an associate professor here. So I'm very excited okay. about. Yeah, I'm very excited yeah. about uh, building. And then when does that when does that actually start, or uh, uh, is it ongoing now, or is it uh, you got to wait for the new year, so to speak? Uh, no, it's ongoing. I mean, I'm actually I'm teaching a real intensive course uh, this summer, and I'll have a couple of weeks, and then uh, full full tier in the uh, in the fall, starting in September. So fantastic, fantastic! It's, I, I love it. Without it's, it's something which I always wanted to do when I was uh, young. I wanted to be a teacher, but I missed out on some final qualifications and ended up doing other things. But uh, I'm now just getting round with my free online workshop, uh, doing some some teaching and got mm. quite a few guys following me. So it's something which I want to try and develop myself uh, as uh, as time goes by. Mm. Sean, we come to that time of the show with a lot of my guests. I always say this, a lot of my guests prefer <laughs> to duck the question. Okay. Uh, probably, <laughs> probably because they don't want to be considered as though they're so entrenched in in this person that they favor and they love their work that they're going to be compared to it or whatever reasons but can i ask you this question who is your favorite photographer at this time at this time oh gosh um you know i i guess irving penn it's it's always yeah. got to come back it, it's always got to come back to penn because um you know i saw a photograph or a print a platinum print that he had done of the cigarettes and it to this day just ruins me. I mean, it was, it was the one, the, the print that, um, you know, always pushes me. And the thing about, um, Penn that is just so remarkable is back to that Paul Rand quote about, um, just try to be good that Penn transcends all, you know, I mean, he's fashion or still life or portrait or fine art or all of these things. I mean, they could be ads or they could be in a museum or they could be in a book. It was just, they were just perfect, you know? Yeah. And um, So I, that's why it's, it's always got to come back to, uh, it's always got to come back to him. And I had, I love so many, you know, I mean, I, I collect books and try to look at a lot of photographs and there's, you know, could just the, the, there is there are there are literally I, i'm going to say hundreds of photographers out there that i just love their work obviously mm. Cartier bresson brassai latigue for instance those immediately come to mind joseph kudelka yep. um, but as you say there is when it comes down to it isn't it it's, it's strange what you say there's just one image one image <laughs> that catches you and you and you and you keep on Every time you see it, whether it's in a book or whether you're fortunate enough to see it printed and hanging on a wall, it, it just catches you. For me, it's uh, the uh, the, po- the postman crossing the snowy street in New York mm. by Soul Lighter. Yeah, I, I, it just it's there. Everything in that photograph is just what I love about photography, and I think that's the way you 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 decide on your favorite photographer if that's what is it. it, it that yeah. is the photograph that catches catches you. Yeah. But, the other, the other side of my two favorite questions, which I love to ask my guests, is the the influence, the most influential person that uh, has. I used to call this inspirational part, but I think it's a better word to use as influential. Who would you say has influenced you the most in your photography? Who? Um, and it doesn't have to be a photographer; it could be family member or whatever. Yeah, you know, um, my my father certainly, uh, you know, a big influence. Um, I, I think in the beginning of my career, uh, it would have to it would have to be that sculptor where um, 
you know, I had this opportunity to share my work with um, someone who is uh, very visually fluent. I mean, he's an amazing sculptor and has a background in photography. Um, and my the dark room that I was working out of was in his studio where he was making sculpture. So I had I had these years in the beginning with someone who was very uh, you know discerning and kind of acute, uh, tearing my pictures apart. You know, and um, the way that he lives, the way that he works as an artist, um, is a, just a big influence, and uh, I'm very indebted to him for that. Yeah. So uh, his name is John Christensen, a uh, really wonderful sculptor and artist. Um, so, so that, and then you know, the other part of it, like, like is an amalgamation of all my heroes because um, you know I, I learned and and found everyone through through their books. So you know whether it's uh, Penn or Albert Watson or the Starn brothers or Michael Kenna, you know, like you were just saying, we could go on and on. Ray Metzger, on. You're quite right? right. You're so you many know? Great photographers out there. Yeah, so just that amalgamation of that, you know, Paul Rand, the graphic designer, um, certainly another one. Um, just in, in the way that they, you know, they gave their lives to something. Um, and tried to make stuff of quality. I just, I just love that. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed listening to your comments about your work and your, hearing about your, your career, how it's developed from music through to your photography. And now, finally, uh, well, 16 years you've been doing it, but you know, you, <laughs> that's no, a long time you. now <laughs> uh, as, as a lecturer in Austin, Texas there. Thank you so much for, for joining me this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I hope uh, the viewers uh, that have been watching and will watch on the uh, YouTube later will will get the same sort of uh, enjoyment that I have out of uh, out of my, our chat today. Uh, thanks again. Oh, and just as, sorry, go and carry no, on. I just to say, no, no, my pleasure. I mean, I thank you so much for uh, finding me and having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's great. Not at all. Not at all. Your work deserves to be, to be shown uh, more so than what it is. Um, it's really just for me to say, folks, uh, who've been watching the show, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, and, um, well, we've got one more day to go to the weekend, but when you're out shooting this weekend, you know what I'm going to say, leave your camera bag at home. Bye <laughs> for now. <laughs>